We have a very special event today. We have our guest uh, speaker, Dr. Chris Gertzen, uh, give a talk today. So I'd like to introduce Chris Gertzen, although he doesn't need any introduction. Um, Dr. Gertzen is a professor of musicology at the University of Southern Mississippi with research emphasis on ethnomusicology. Uh, Dr. Gertzen has published articles and books including um, American folk fiction, <coughs> traditional aspects of popular music in Europe and the Americas, and Native American powwows. His today's talk is entitled, Texas Contest Fiddling, What Modern Vi Variation Technique Tells Us. Please welcome Dr. Gertzen. I, I'm interested in general in how crafts and types of music that have been maintained by uh, blue collar citizens are changing these days all over the United States and Latin America and Europe as, as the nature of being blue collar changes then, uh, then crafts can edge towards being arts uh, and fiddling is, is like that uh, the older fiddling in the United States it's bipartite dance tunes, mostly reels, called breakdowns here. And, but they sound a lot like they did in the days of blackface minstrelsy. That is, you've got a fiddle and a banjo in heterophony. And instead of the old percussion, you've, you've got a, a guitar and a bass. But, but it's really quite old in a way. But the style today I'm going to talk about is the youngest Texas style, the one that makes the players of the older styles mad. <laughs> Be, because kids like it better. Uh, this is a, a revision of a talk I gave uh, in Aberdeen, Scotland two summers ago uh, for the North Atlantic Fiddle Convention. Uh, people who study fiddle from all kinds of countries that touch the North Atlantic. So the uh, Texas fiddling is, both, is virtuosic both technically and musically and it's very popular if we could magically total up the man hours spent cultivating the various fiddle styles of North America, this would clearly be the dominant one. Texas fiddling has spread through much of the United States, and it and its regional variations are often uh, simply grouped under the rubric contest style. It's attracted converts and aroused resentment where it supplemented or indeed supplanted older styles. It's the youngest of the major American fiddle styles, and the least wedded to dance. That is, it's the most display-oriented, listening-oriented style. Audiences tap their feet, savor contestant face-offs, and cheer. And the fiddlers themselves, though they join fiddlers in all of the international fiddle contest systems in believing that jamming in the parking lot is much more important than what happens on stage. These guys really do dig in and compete. What marks quality? What marks the winners? Partly technique, but even more how they build performances through weaving a speedy but intricate structure of variations. I'll sprinkle my talk with general remarks about the style, but my target is that variation technique. How does it work? What can we learn about fiddlers' beliefs concerning the essences of given tunes through how they vary them? First, a sample. Here's a typical breakdown, an originally bipartite dance tune that started life in Scotland in the mid-18th century, and I learned how to say this while I was in Aberdeen. It's the Braze of Octretire. In, in the young United States, it was called the Bows of Albany, and then by the 1920s, Billy in the Low Ground.
Hopkins. He's a welder. No lessons, no music reading. His dad, a retired policeman, fiddles, as do his best friends. He and one buddy drive around in a pickup truck and listen to old cassette tapes and figure out licks. And they also join up with other fiddlers and trade tunes on many a well-lubricated evening. This uh, performance was from the Texas State Championship from April of 2010. Uh, that takes place in Hallettsville, a town of two or 3,000 uh, midway between Houston and San Antonio. Uh, most American fiddle contests are fundraisers for chambers of commerce of small towns or for benevolent organizations. This one's put on by the Knights of Columbus, a quasi-Masonic group with basically the same membership as the local business community. They've built and expanded their meeting hall with the funds generated by this and related events. Other times a year, they host a domino championship, a buck hunting contest, you compare antler spans and buy dinner, and a polka and sausage festival that culminates in a polka mass. Pause and reflect there, a polka mass. Um, there, there are a lot of checks in the area, so hence the, the polkas. Uh, this weekend, late in April each year, has a group of fundraisers clustered around the fiddle contest. There's a simultaneous barbe barbecue contest involving big fleets of cast iron smokers, uh, a crawfish feast, a songwriting contest, a craft fair, a carnival, but the anchor is the fiddle contest. By the time Carl Hopkins played Billy in the Low Ground on that Sunday afternoon, the tune had already been aired a dozen times during the weekend, and we'd hear it again before heading home, and it's only medium popular, in the top ten but not the top five. All good Texas fiddlers know the same few dozen tunes very well. The central repertoire is surprisingly small in number of tunes, but nevertheless rich in total musical content. Fiddlers agree on roughly how to play the initial presentations of the two main strains of any tune. And they also agree on the main procedures fueling their shared exuberant and detailed variation technique. In that technique, there's a complicated relationship between a nested pair of broad understandings, first concerning how variation proceeds for all core tunes, and second, typical variation behavior for the specific tune in question, and then that pair of factors balances with freedoms taken with those norms to express regional, personal, and spur-of-the-moment takes on a tune. These techniques of building a performance weren't brand new when we can first witness Texas fiddling that is, in the hillbilly recording starting in 1922. But they've developed considerably since. Both of the tunes we'll look at closely today were recorded back then. Uh, the Texas fiddler who got into a studio first and was the one... Do you, do you have this? Yeah, it's okay, we're ready. Uh, the Texas fiddler who got into a studio first and was also the one uh, recorded most early on was Alexander Camel Robertson, nicknamed Eck. He grew up in a family full of fiddlers in Texas near the Oklahoma border. He became a medicine show and vaudeville music musician and tuned pianos on the side. He made some recordings in, with a friend in 1922 in New York. These were the very first so-called hillbilly recordings, thus the earliest country music. He made another set in Dallas in 1929, near the end of the time that fiddling had a major presence on national radio. Country music was changing. But he played in contests most of his life. We have a last set of recordings of him from a session in the 60s. His tunes documented in the 20s reveal a repertoire in flux, very dramatic flux. Some performances are old style. Each of the two strains is repeated literally in the usual pattern, A-A-B-B, A-A-B-B, until time's up. Uh, here meaning until the, the 78 RPM record site is full, earlier until the dance was over. But he, like several other Texas fiddlers back then, was searching for more musical content than just alternating two strains offered. He played a couple of literal medleys, and there are several tunes displaying an early form of Texas variation. Sally Johnson, one of the five most common Texas 
fiddle tunes today was both in a medley, that is, there were two tunes uh, back to back on the record side, and he did some varying. We'll hear it, we'll stop right after he takes a left turn into the second tune in the medley. So here's Eck Robertson playing Sally Johnson in 1922. start in different ranges, like the main strains in most tunes in most fiddle repertoires. I love sentences like that, big global things. Uh, after twice through A and twice through B, he varies A in the earliest typical way of doing so in Texas style uh, that you heard. He thins the rhythm. He'll go on to do roughly the same thing with a B strain, and then another neat thing happens in that second pair of B strains, some minor melodic variation that it's, it's hard to, to hear when it goes by. What happens is you're not bored. <laughs> uh, this is a factor to become pervasive in later Texas fiddling. And there's a third strain, a low one, that I called C. Remember that the A and B strains contrasted in initial, in initial tessitura. Uh, the A strain was on the D string and up, and the B strain, strain was sitting higher and then the third C strain busied itself down on the G string. Uh, if you, you can't remember, but I swear that the rhythm of the C strain and the initial double stop on a third uh, suggests that C maybe grew out of A. All these factors matter for later Texas fiddling. Again, each tune starts as two strains exploiting different pitch ranges. There will be both minor and significant variations Rhythmic thinning, that is holding on to notes or double stops, remains an important variation technique. Maybe most important, the pervasive fact practice of variation does not carry us all the way from a two-strain tune to an actual medley. That is, the strains beyond the basic two have something to do with those first two principal strains. We'll hear two performances of Sally Johnson from the 2010 Texas State Championship. Uh, first one by Mia Orozco, 16 years old, in her first year in the adult competition bracket. Uh, like lots of kids who fiddle really well, she's in a family that's made fiddling a family priority. Kids working hard on this don't have time to get into trouble. That, that's the theory I heard over and over again. Uh, you see lots of big fiddle-oriented families at these contests. Uh, often ones that homeschool, and sure enough, me is homeschooled, families that are politically and especially religiously conservative. Like many of the strong young players, Mia started in the Suzuki violin method. Uh, a lot of Suzuki teachers in the U.S. are inclined to borrow and employ simple versions of fiddle tunes in a rather patronizing way, as a brief way station in a kid's inexorable march towards Paganini. But, but some of those kids veer off into the fiddle world, 
carrying with them the flexible bow arm and overall search for relaxed and effective technique of Suzuki, but in every other way, taking a one-way trip to fiddling. Here's Mia Roscoe playing Sally Johnson. Robertson's version. Her technique is great. It's authentic in the nuances of intonation and rhythm and attack. Those are exactly the thing that, that uh, classical violinists who convert late in life to contest fiddling don't quite get right. Uh, the variations are just fine, right on target for modern Texas fiddling. There's a lot of variation. Far fewer measures are exact repeats than in older Texas playing. The strains that Robertson played are all there, and the possibility that the third one comes out of A is reinforced because there's an octave version of the low one and it's more similar to the first one. Same and with the same opening rhythm. There are so many held thirds at the beginnings of strains. That idea and the shape of the cadence stick out. Uh, those are the topics that this tune is about. Uh, we already suspected that from the prominent thirds in Eck Robertson's version, but, but this gives us explicit confirmation. I brought one more version of Sally Johnson for you, one by Wes Westmoreland III, uh, played about an hour later at this contest, which Wes would go on to win for the fifth time. Uh, he's in his early 40s. He played for 10 years with Mel Tillis's Country Western Band in Branson, Missouri, and now is a pharmacist who still moonlights as a fiddler. Let's hear West Westmoreland Sally Johnson.
pretty similar to Mia's version, but with differences too. The similarities, basically the same strains, deployed in pairs, with variations that are similar to Mia's. What these versions share, we see in many dozens of other performances. That's together what constitute the modern Sally Johnson. The differences, Wes places a little bit less emphasis on the interval of a third, though still plenty. There's more incidental variation, thus fewer measures duplicating previous ones, yet tighter formal construction with more neat symmetries. And these are things that it's, it's hard to, to know you're hearing, but that, that tie it together. He does this sort of thing all the time, both broadly and in intimate details. He denies being conscious of doing this. And our noticing it uh, consciously has to be a matter of painstaking after the fact analysis. It is no fun to transcribe these puppies. But, <clears throat> but things emerge. But this is all part of what makes his playing powerful, part of why he won first place and Mia got, well, fourth that April. It's something that mature Texas fiddlers do more and better than younger ones. Uh, the other tune for today is a bit trickier. Uh, Gray Eagle is one we can trace back further. It was and is called the Miller of Drone in Scottish fiddling. In the 1830s, a horse race in Kentucky donated the current title of the main American incarnation of the tune. One horse was named Gray Eagle and the other one Wagner. Uh, Wagner's Hornpipe is another of the top ten tunes. Uh, we'll hear an early Texas recording. The, the fiddler is Samuel Peacock who with his brothers made up Smith's Garage Fiddle Band. Uh, Peacock was a prosperous barber. Smith's Garage, owned by a local sheriff, was their sponsor on Fort Worth Radio. This is from 29, I believe. It's cut 11. to earlier versions in Scotland. Uh, and the performance actually opened with that up an octave. And that's uh, already in the old time versions of Grey Eagle. It doesn't start in the Texas version. In fact, that general idea was already around in Scotland in the 18th century. There's a tune called Lord MacDonald's Reel, which lives on both as itself in Scotland and as leather breeches in both southern fiddling and Texas fiddling. Uh, and it has an A and a B and an octave A. The octave A is of uh, Gray Eagle is striking, and Peacock started with it. Uh, and there's a strain recognizable as the historic Scottish B strain, and there's the historic A strain that we, we stopped during. And there are a couple more, maybe coming out of A or B, but they're not real clear. Uh, some of those strains that we, we didn't hear have harmonic underpinnings, more like A or more like B, but the alliances aren't strong. What is certain is that only A and B have the musical heft of main strains. Let's uh, see what a modern version can tell us. This one uh, will be by Bubba Hopkins. I mean Zerl Hopkins III. No, I mean Bubba. At, at the same contest, about an hour before Mia would be on deck, 
He's going to get second prize. He's a college student and a fiddle teacher, closer to Mia than to Wes and Carl in age and background. So Bubba Hopkins, Gray Eagle. happened. Uh, my take on it is this. The, the A strain of Grey Eagle is a sweeping arpeggio, and B starts out by outlining a chord two. Bubba is emphasizing that. Most of what happens outside of A and B proper involves broad arpeggios or other chord outlining. Listening to dozens of other modern Texas versions of Grey Eagle confirms this. Bubba's Grey Eagle is representative. That's what Grey Eagle is about. Now this permeation with arpeggios wasn't the only thing that could have happened to this tune in Texas. It, it wasn't musically or historically inevitable. In the opening measure of the Miller of Drone and in older versions of Grey Eagle, the sixth degree of the scale sticks out. In, in another universe, in another cumulative set of choices, that sixth degree of the scale could have been the topic of the variations instead of the arpeggios. That does happen in another tune, the first one I played for you today. In Billy and the Lowgrounds' Ancestors, and in early commercial recordings of Billy, including ones in nascent Texas style, the sixth degree sticks out in the melody, but is harmonized with a subdominant. That is, we're in the key of C and you hear lots of F chords. But in the tune's evolution in Texas fiddling, the prominent note A, the sixth degree, soon inspired accompaniment with A minor instead of F major and chords that approach and come off from A minor. And Billy in the Low Grounds, typical modern cluster of variations, emphasizes that. Here's a chunk of another performance to illustrate that. Uh, Mia Orozco again, I like her. Uh, listen to the chords based on one versus those on six. Uh, hear lots of C major and A minor. Billy in the low ground.
to summarize, in modern Texas fiddling, Sally Johnson is mostly about the major third sitting on the tonic, Gray Eagle's mostly about arpeggios, and Billy in the low ground is mostly about the C major to A minor access, axis. Each of the big Texas tunes could be characterized similarly. All of them start with two distinctive strains. All add parts, some obviously derived from the opening two strains, some maybe not, but the added parts aren't meaty enough to stand alone. They're variations in one or another meaning of that term. And the array of variations associated with each of the big Texas tunes do take off from something about the opening strains and elaborately emphasize whatever that is. An aficionado, and this was an auditorium full of them on that weekend, can be plopped down anywhere within a performance of Sally Johnson or one called Sally Gooden or Billy in the Low Ground or Tom and Jerry, another famous one, and instantly recognize the tune within a second. Wes and Carl and Mia and Bubba and every accomplished Texas fiddler play all of these hit tunes and their variations are both wonderfully personal and group nicely within the broadly accepted identity of each tune. Each tune is thus kind of like an Indian raga, some parts fairly fixed, other parts elaborated in ways associated with the style or with the tune or with the performer yet unique to the specific performance. One of the accusations regularly leveled against Texas contest fiddling by old-time fiddlers is it all sounds alike. Uh, yes, there is a stylistic wash that is much of what you hear and is as deep in as many ears travel on first hearing. The long bows, the Texas swing chords, the general nature of variation. But then, returning to India, to some folks, all Indian food tastes alike. Most such criticisms are temporary symptoms of an early stage in acquaintance. This is not to say that education and intimacy automatically yield affection. My repeated experiences with college songs, with liver, with the family of conditions called the flu, and with politicians still leave me cold. But I've come to like Texas fiddling. It's adventurous exciting for the fiddlers and for experienced audiences. And it's musically rich with a variation technique that both impresses as such and as a set of historically informed documents. Each solid performance is a cumulative interpretation and elaboration, revealing and decorating the essence of a tune. Performance is analysis. And you can yell and clap too. <laughs> of people that we think of as country western artists were called and marketed uh, as hillbilly recordings. And uh, 1922, Sally Gooden, a different Sally, by that guy, Eck Robertson, was the very first. Uh, and then after a couple decades, uh, what was a revealed oral tradition has the star system kick in and electric instruments kick in and it's country and western music and then it's country music. So that's an order. Now, bluegrass, um, the fiddlers, some of them come out of old-time fiddling for their sort of family fiddle backgrounds, and some come out of Texas fiddling. Uh, the difference is that when they play an instrumental tune, uh, the fiddle only has a couple runs through a string. So what they try to do is sort of summarize what an old-time fiddler or a Texas fiddler, depending, uh, would do in a whole performance, they summarize it. 
So uh, chromaticism comes in faster and variation appears more swiftly. But you, you've got a Texas fiddle uh, based bluegrass fiddlers like Byron Burlow that uh, do this stuff only compressed in their bluegrass performances. We know that bluegrass is an offshoot of country music uh, when a number of people in the, uh, in the 40s said, ooh, electric instruments, no, no. And that, along with other conservative things, uh, started off bluegrass. So you're saying bluegrass started in the 40s? Uh, every bluegrass scholar will give a different date. But in the 30s and 40s, you have uh, Bill and Birch Monroe and uh, uh, a couple other like brother groups that are playing something that at some point is bluegrass. Uh, you can practically throw a dart. It's like saying, when did the middle class begin? And you know, 100 years here or there, depending on your interpretation. But 30s and 40s, let's say. So right. it's not a particularly an outgrowth of Appalachian music, it's more an outgrowth of country music? Well, country music is an outgrowth of, of Appalachian music. And bluegrass is a conservative backlash against the progress within country music. Yes. From your research, what do you know about the preparation process of these fiddlers when they go to competitions? I know that you know when they get together for jam sessions, they're improvising, using all this vocabulary of mix and patterns. But I wonder. When, if you know, you know, when they prepare for these competitions, if their solos are, how much of the pre-planning depends. There is and how uh, much uh, improvisation. Uh, there's no clean line between improvisation and fixed performance. And, you know, if you, if you play jazz in a club and you play the same tune, two hundred nights in a row, it may have been pretty free to start with, but but you coalesce on it fairly fixed thing that sounds improvised <laughs> by the end. The, the younger players, the, the uh, performances are uh, fairly fixed. Mia, uh, when she plays that tune three, four times, it's almost identical. Wes, uh, he's a wild man. He, he's so good, he can improvise on stage every time. I, I've uh, transcribed a tune called Dusty Miller, one of the top ten by him about 10 times, and, and I'm surprised every time. Is there any kind of stigma up against uh, this pre-planning of solos? And, and well, it's considered part of the learning process, that if, if you have a fixed version, you're not there yet. But you, what, what they do sometimes is some, a, a good young fiddler will uh, have a recording that is of a tune, whether improvised or fixed. It's fixed now in the recording. And they'll duplicate it, or in a labored way vary from it, or learn it from their teacher, and then play it fixed for them. It, it, it's, a, again, like, in, like an uh, Indian Sarod player who uh, plays exercises for four hours in the morning uh, the same way every time, and then in the afternoon is improvising. That's, that's sort of the short form of what they do over years in, in Texas fiddling. Uh, some of the regional variations, there's very little improvisation on the spot. Uh, for instance, the, there's a contest called the National Contest in Weezer, Idaho, where you're required to play a medley of three tunes, a reel, a waltz, and what's called a tune of choice. Might be a rag or a shotish or something. Uh, and you have to play your medley within four minutes. And so you don't have as much room to improvise. And they fix those things, and they're just little jewels. Not near as much fun. Fun. It was another, there was a question over here. Is that me? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, um, I was simply curious about the, I think that the first Jack Robertson recording you, you, you played, Chris, was um, the 1922 yeah. recording. Those were obviously acoustic recordings, right? The very yeah. early primitive techniques. Have they been remastered? That sounded very crisp. That was remastered. Okay, okay. I was curious about that. Yeah, but you, you, you can cut out the garbage, but you can't make, 
you can't create good stuff. Right. Yeah. So yeah. so the remastered early recording sound a little pale. Like a remastered early recording. Yeah, they, yeah. they do. Yeah. 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 The uh, the Eck Robertson recording was remastered. The Smiths Garage Band was not, and and that's why I cut off the Smiths Garage Band after a while. I heard it, uh, and so would you have? Yes. Um, my question is kind of regarding the the culture of the whole thing. I find it really interesting that most of these people's uh, professions are not music; they do yeah. other things, and like you said, very blue collar things. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering if you could elaborate. Well, a very few of them, a very few of them end up being fiddle teachers and then stay in the culture that way. And as I mentioned, Wes was a professional fiddler for a while, a professional country western fiddler. And uh, half a dozen of the top Texas fiddlers are earning a living in Nashville right now uh, as session fiddlers. Um, The highest you go socioeconomically on a routine basis is the lower reaches of the medical field. So there are a number of dentists who fiddle, and Wes is a pharmacist. Uh, old time fiddling has more uh, self-conscious urban enthusiasm. Uh, white collar people not drawing on family tradition, but rather being nostalgic uh, will, will find it easy to reproduce the sounds. And there, there's a, a fiddle contest and festival in Clifftop, West Virginia, that has, that's about half regular old time fiddlers and half urban enthusiasts. And there are lots of doctors and lawyers and professors there. And that's the fiddling that attracts academics mostly. I remember one time at a, at a Clifftop, I ran into 10 academics and in, uh, the big Texas fiddle contest, I almost never run into anybody else from, from the academy. Yes, sir. Wasn't Henry Ford really into fiddling? Henry Ford hated jazz. <laughs> he thought it was very corrupting. And so he supported fiddle contests in the 1920s at Ford dealerships. The, this was old time stuff. Uh, and. Uh, it, it kind of got out of hand sometimes. There was a fiddler named Millie Dunham from Maine who uh, did some of his own publicity and expected to make money off of being in a fiddle contest and, and was just a, a rollicking fellow. Yeah. Yeah, but um, fiddle, fiddle contests are very white. Uh, no, nobody says that if you're not white, you can't show up. and and um, but it's it's always a surprise at one of these fiddle contests when you're walking around and so say it's on a college campus and there'll be a, a black sorority earning money selling barbecue or something and it, it's a surprise it's a surprise and, and it's I think because of the the nature of blue collar nostalgia that it, it's it's whites that think that the 1910s and 20s were a grand time. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. In the competition, uh, is it judged live or are the performances yeah. taped? Uh, mostly, most little contests, like the Texas contest, have a, a long table. Well, here's the stage and there's the fiddler. And uh, here, five feet away, is a long table and there are five people who have all won the championship sometime. And, uh, and their scores are added up, and these days they throw out high and low, you know, the Olympic technique, and uh, it's done on the spot. And you can do it instantly. I, I've done some judging. I'm not a fiddling, because I, I don't, I'm not by insiders, uh, by the insider way of choosing a judge, I'm not qualified, because I'm not a champion fiddler. Uh, so I, I judge other instruments in the old time contests where they have, um, in old time contests, the brackets are by performance medium. So you've got fiddle or harmonica or, or mandolin or whatever. And in Texas, the different brackets are just by age. While there's a guitar accompaniment bracket, almost everything else is, 
is uh, junior fiddlers, or little kid fiddlers, junior fiddlers, ancient fiddlers, fiddlers from out of state. <laughs> like, really, 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 there's, there's called it, there's a, a bracket at this contest called Gone to Texas, which was a, a sign that lots of people put on their farms when they migrated to Texas in the, during the 19th, early 20th centuries. And there the, the big Idaho fiddlers come in. But when you're judging, really, uh, within a second or two, you know how good they are. Well, within a second or two, but some of your evaluations there about the large-scale symmetry, it seems right. to depend upon either a good year for um, you know, architecture mm -hmm. um, um, or, or a tape. <laughs> so that's what I was wondering if, if they right. the judges no, are curious about no, that. That's one of those things that's not articulated within the culture, but they hear it. They hear it. Yeah, there, there's the first moment, and you, and you, you know pretty much where the fiddler's going to be. Then they can blow it. You know, if a few errors, it's like Olympic skating or something. You make a mistake, you're gone. Uh, <coughs> uh, although Carl Hopkins has won while making mistakes, and he laughs too. And he's playing along, he goes, oh! And even if you didn't hear the mistake, there it is, presented to you by him. <laughs> but, he, but he's just so exuberant and so good that uh, he won last year, I'm told. I didn't go last year. But, uh, so that mostly you can do it within a second or two, but also you have the performance. Judging is arduous. I thought Mia's was better because I'm not an experienced listener and it sounded more flashy to me in the way that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the way that in, um, you spoke of Raga in the way that um, sometimes uh, more seasoned listeners appreciate subtleties that aren't about virtuosity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I liked her uh, better the first time too. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty far along, but I'm not yeah. at, the, at the end point. Then after 10, 15 times, I liked it. Wes is better. Mm -hmm. But the, the real judges, the real fiddlers, they know it's simple. Are there any significant, you mentioned C major a lot, but uh, are, are, is there any significant significance in keys, or are there mostly in a few keys, or? Uh, the, the violin keys. Yeah, so. Okay. You know, C and, C and point sharp, <laughs> <laughs> for, for the most part. Uh, uh, D is the commonest key in both okay. old time and Texas, uh, but there are some uh, tunes in A that are big favorites. Uh, we're in old time fiddling. In fact, you uh, have scordaturas for that. You raise the low two strings each uh, step and maybe lower the E string to C sharp if you're really having an A major party. Uh, but it's hard to get much variety out of that. You, you get a lot of resonance, but you may not get a lot of variety. But in, in Texas, um, Sally Gooden, uh, the very first Hillbilly tune. Is, is in A these days. It was in G back in old time, but that wasn't as much. It wasn't as violent, uh, friendly to the violin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And although the keys, I mean, I say major, but in some of the tunes, we're in between a major and a modal. And it's, it's the, the fingers starting out like that and sort of creaking together a little bit. That's a better explanation than any of like noon tone etc etc it's actually the the, uh, the fingers becoming more equidistant in a way that um, where that flaw becomes a virtue <laughs> so what about the new style of playing gets at the old style enthusiasts what what bothers them yeah well they're just showing off and and uh, and the kids want to do that instead the kids, the kids like the fancy stuff. Uh, the old, older style still works well for dances. That there's, there's a lot of variation within uh, the old time southeastern styles, but it's rhythmic in nature. It's, it's subtleties of heterophony between the, the fiddle and the banjo, and subtleties that don't add up to a shape. These Texas performances have a dramatic shape, and the old-time ones don't. 
Now, of course, that makes the old time ones better for a dance when, when the length of the dance determines how long you should play. And some of the old time players still play for square dances. But if you're just listening and you're a fiddler, then the Texas is pretty much fun. And so all except the Southeast and some folks in New England and, and uh, few people on the border with Canada that say, I'm going to pretend I'm from Ontario and have a little bit different stuff. <coughs> there, there are at the, the na so-called national contest in Weezer, Idaho, uh, the local version of Texas style rules. But there are urban enthusiasts for old time style that come and camp in a certain area. And they don't go anywhere near the, the uh, contest stage during the whole week of the contest. They're just there to soak up the energy and, and to jam with one another. Every fiddler says the jamming at the parking lot and the campground is more important. But how much more important varies? Are there any international competitions? If you are in Scotland or? There are fiddle contests all across the North Atlantic. Uh, the, Irish are big. Uh, we have, so do they go into a separate category then, or oh, are they all oh, all together? No, we, if, if you're in Ireland, you play the Irish stuff, and, and they're international uh, stars. Uh, not Texas, Texas fiddling, it's just too darn hard. But the Idaho, Texas fiddling, now and then there's somebody from, from uh, some place like, some international place like New York, or uh, foreign countries. Yeah, foreign <laughs> countries. Yeah, that in effect is a foreign country. Uh, and uh, at uh, Gay the old time fiddle convention in Gay Lakes, Virginia, I went to this this last June, and there was a fine group from uh, Czech Republic playing old time stuff, and just couldn't communicate, couldn't talk, but they could play all right. They didn't win anything, and they were puzzled. <laughs> they, they were a little too clean in how they played. But, uh, yeah. So I ask, in terms of contest fiddling, is, is Texas to contest fiddling, say, with Las Vegas is to poker, like that's where yeah. the top notch is? Texas, well, it depends on who you ask. But the Texas fiddlers are certain that the best fiddling is by Texas fiddlers. and. Uh, and there's a certain level of believing that is so all over the United States. Yeah. yeah That's the touchstone. In this contest, these are the best players. These, these are the ones. So if you don't like this, you're not going to like any Texas Chris? Um, how, how can you say that um, these judges know after the first couple seconds uh, what the quality of a player is if the performance is mainly about the variation? It's because the players that sound the best for two seconds are also going to have the best variations. Uh, no, the, your first reaction is probably going to be on target. Your, your two second reaction will almost certainly be on target although there is more evidence forthcoming. Okay. I, it's a good thing, too, because the judging, uh, the time for you to total up your numbers, and the, there, there are categories in which to award numbers. Uh, in most contests, there's pitch and rhythm and authenticity and like two other things. and. Uh, most of us that judge, the first thing we think of is a total number. And, and then we have to divvy it up real fast and then <laughs> hand our piece of paper away and then the next guy starts. Uh -huh. Yeah. Maybe one, <laughs> maybe one out of ten judges actually goes nine, ten, eleven, seven, like that. All the others go, seventy-four. Okay. <laughs> and then pass in their little piece of paper. It's very tiring. Yeah. Where does Cajun fiddling stand in this world? It's a different style. Uh, interestingly, the Louisiana State Contest is mostly Texas fiddling, but then uh, 
there are usually a few prizes reserved for Cajun style fiddlers. Yeah, I went to a workshop a couple of summers ago, Lord Fiddlers from based in Texas and based in Nashville, but yeah. all different styles, but they only Cajun fiddlers. So I, I wonder if it's, it's under Well, it's not the it's not the central instrument anymore for for Cajun music. The accordion is. Yeah, I it's not as interesting. It, it can be exuberant and fun as part of a an ensemble texture. I, I like it less than any of the old time styles. But I love Cajun accordion. Mm -hmm. well, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, Joey Watson, for taking this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.